uh, grants that we've been pursuing. Um, we're uh, first, I just wanted to start off with a refresher for everybody, uh, particularly the members of the public watching on uh, the, the highlights of IIJA before getting into um, the discussion about funding that we've received, uh, outstanding grants, and then things that are in progress. So first with the overview, um, IIJA, which is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, was passed and signed by President, passed by Congress and signed by President Biden in uh, November of 2021. Uh, it funds about 350 different programs uh, across uh, 12 categories of infrastructure, bridges, uh, transit, roadways, uh, broadband, water, et cetera. Uh, the funding from IIJA is available over a five-year period, um, fiscal year 22 through 26 of, of the federal fiscal year. Uh, it builds off of the baseline federal funding from the uh, standard transportation reauthorization and adds to that through new funding to new programs and existing programs of an additional uh, approximately $550 billion. Uh, the various programs function on different time cycles. Um, some of the programs are, are one-time awards. Some of them uh, come up annually. Uh, and then finally, uh, the funding is largely uh, split between two different types. There's formula funds. These funds uh, typically go to the states, uh, and then the states distribute those funds internally, uh, either through their own formulas or through their own discretionary competitive processes. Um, or there's federal federally managed by the different agencies uh, discretionary grants, and that's largely what uh, we are focusing on, and what this present the rest of this presentation will focus on our efforts to uh, pursue, identify, uh, and secure as many of those discretionary grant funds as possible uh, for the city and also for our region. Um, on those programs, the the guidance. Uh, for the existing programs, the guidance uh, is out there, but in some cases is also being modified uh, by the IIJA. The new programs, those the guidance is being developed, and there are still some of the programs from IIJA that have not had their uh, initial rollout yet. Uh, but we are also getting to the point where programs are starting to hit their second year of funding. So we're having more consistency in knowing what the guidelines are going to be ahead of time as we move into the new round of uh, funding. So the city's approach to this was to establish the IIJA task force. And this is a multi-departmental team of uh, staff here in City Hall, uh, chaired by the Office of Resilience and Sustainability, and including uh, members from the, the Chief Administrative Office, uh, the Health Department, the Office of Community Assets and Investments, Intergovernmental Relations, the Project Delivery Unit, et cetera. Uh, the tasks that, that we're pursuing is um, linking projects uh, that have been identified, and these projects are coming from largely from existing plans, the capital improvement plan, for example, uh, that have gone through a process of project identification, vetting, adoption, linking those projects to the funding programs that are available. Um, and then also uh, finding the opportunities where the new fund, the new programs that have been created um, may have priorities, eligibilities that don't necessarily match up with pre-existing or pre-identified projects, but we still have needs in those areas and, and determining how we can best match these new programs to those uh, known and existing needs here in the city. Uh, a couple resources that people can, can uh, utilize to learn more information at, at the various levels of government uh, on the city's website at nola.gov slash IIJA. Uh, there's information there about the city's approach to IIJA, uh, the awards that we have received so far to date, uh, on the state's website at infrastructure.la.gov. Uh, they similarly have uh, information about all the IIJA money that has come to Louisiana, both formula funds and discretionary funds. And then at the federal level, uh, build.gov is, is the White House's centralized website for information on all of, um, programs within IIJA, and then that, that leads you to the various federal agencies that um, manage and administer those programs. So with that background, um, 
we'll move into a discussion of uh, the projects so far. Uh, starting off with funding that has been awarded. Um, so, as I mentioned, there there are hundreds of different programs in IIJA. The city is an eligible applicant for some of these, but we're not necessarily the eligible applicant for all of these. So I'm going to be discussing both uh, discretionary funds that the city as an entity has received, but also funds that partners within the geographic area of the city of New Orleans have received um, that we have supported and worked with them to help secure those resources, uh, taking the approach of we want to make sure as many of these resources come to our community, whether it's to the city of New Orleans itself or to other public entities or community partners um, in the community. So on, on this slide, um, these are the awards to date that the city of New Orleans itself has secured. Um, the Bayou Bienvenue um, Restoration Preliminary Design, this is from the National Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, we've recently received a broadband outreach and equity program uh, or for our proposed broad broadband outreach and equity program, and that's from the Affordable Connectivity Program. Uh, Chef Highway Safety and Complete Street Study, that's utilizing uh, Federal Highway Administration planning funds. Uh, also the I-10 New Orleans East Service Road Safety Study. Uh, from the same funding source, Sanchez Sanchez Center uh, microgrid design from the Building Resilience Infrastructure and Building Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, also known as BRIC program, uh, and the Transportation Safety Action Plan from the Safe Streets and Roads for All uh, program at USDOT. Uh, from our partner entities, uh, they've also been uh, receiving grants over the last year or so. Um, so these next two slides um, are partner entities located here in New Orleans. Um, CPRA received funding for Central Wetlands um, uh, Hydrologic and Habitat Restoration Project, uh, the Central Wetlands being uh, the area north of the Lower Ninth Ward um yeah, there in the city the, the the swamps there between the ninth ward and the uh the inter or gulf intercoastal waterway uh crescent city schools at their harriet tubman campus received uh funds from the clean school bus rebate program uh the deep south center for environmental justice received funding from the thriving communities technical assistance center so they'll be setting up a technical assistance center that can help entities not just in new orleans but across uh the gulf coast uh DOTD received a planning grant from the Reconnecting Communities Program for the Claiborne Corridor. Uh, Councilmember Drusso mentioned earlier some of the entities looking at uh, resilient hubs. Um, Feed the Second Line uh, received funding from the Inclusive Energy Innovation Prize. Uh, that's a Department of Energy program. The airport received funding for their North-South Roadway through the Airport Terminal Program. Uh, RPC has received funds from the Federal Land Access Program for the Bayou Savage Access Improvement Plan. Uh, our partners over at RTA have received two grants uh, from the, the Passenger Ferry Program, uh, in each, one in each of the previous fiscal years. Uh, one is for the Algiers Point Terminal uh, Upgrade and Lower Algiers Maintenance Building Upgrade, and the other is for the Landing Barge Replacement um, at the Algiers Terminal. SUNO uh, received funding for their SUNO Connects program from the Connecting Minority Communities pilot program. Um, and then the University of New Orleans Transportation Institute has received funding as part of uh, two university transportation center programs. Uh, one that they are the lead on, the Center for Equitable Transit Oriented Communities, and one that they are a partner uh, on a team of universities led by the, the University of Arkansas, and that's the Maritime Transportation Research and Education Center. Uh, so those are the the grants that uh, have been awarded so far over the last year or so. Well, That's well, Dan. If I could cut in, oh yeah, um, we do have two new award announcements in the last two days. But um, we'll when we get to that slide, we'll let you all know which ones those are. Yes, um, the the this is a constantly evolving and moving situation. So yeah, one is as early or as recently as just uh, before we came down here for this meeting this morning. Yeah, like an hour ago. Which yeah, is and, always and nice you don't have to read them. through all of them. Yeah, just if you want to, well, on, I wanted to for the awarded ones. Yeah. For the for the rest, um, I'll just <laughs> go th go through um, the slides so they can be on screen for everybody sure. and happy you to hit some of the high points about any of them. Yeah, that's great. If you want to hit some of like the the higher level ones, yep. that's fine. 
So then the next set of uh, applications uh, or the next set of, of projects listed here, and there are um, 27 of them. So a good reason why I won't be going over each one of them individually. Uh, these are programs that have been submitted uh, to a, a particular discretionary funding source, and we are awaiting uh, funding decisions from the federal entity. Uh, the first two pages, uh, slide 17 and 15, oh, sorry, slides 14 and 15, uh, are eight proposals that the city has submitted uh, and is awaiting funding on. Uh, but this is where we have one of the updates, the very first one listed here, the Bayou Bienvenue Marsh Restoration, uh, just announced this morning by NOAA um, that the city is a, uh, a recommended recipient using their wording for this funding. Uh, so this will actually build on the previous grant I mentioned a few minutes ago for the Central Wetlands Bayou Bienvenue area. Um, we received both of these awards now, one from the uh, National Coastal Resilience Fund and now this Coastal Habitat Restoration Resilience Grant. So those funds will stack onto each other to advance the uh, public engagement and the design around the restoration of those wetlands to get us to a 60% 60, uh, 60 design. And Councilman Thomas, that uh, that project's getting a lot of love right now. Uh, and so I appreciate your support uh, helping us through that. Then a couple of proposals to, submitted to the uh, BRIC program, including uh, one for community lighthouses, a, a fairly large ask of uh, $21.7 million. Um, and then uh, on, on the recycling side of things, two grants that we want to point out real quick, uh, just shy of $4 million to the uh, SWIFER program. Uh, this is a, a recycling expansion and planning. This would uh, expand recycling in the city to be fully universal uh, instead of requiring residents to opt in as well as uh, completing a solid waste uh, master plan to move us in, in the direction of better managing our municipal waste. And then the second one, uh, the recycling outreach and training program, uh, this would be uh, uh, focused on engagement and outreach and education to our residents about um, the impacts that they can have through recycling and how to better utilize the recycling services offered today and hopefully the ones in the future that can be enabled by the previous grant. Would would the um, $4 million include glass recycling? Uh, no, the, the expansion um, as outlined in the program would expand the current system citywide, but it would not expand the current materials being accepted. The glass recycling is still coordinated um, uh, in partnership. You know, the city has the drop off on Elysian Fields and uh, we're partnered with Glass Half Full and that's where the glass that the city collects now goes as well uh, to support their efforts with um, coastal restoration. If, if I could just add uh, Councilmember Harris, um, there is some funds in there to do a solid waste master plan. So we could look at how we can expand our recycling services in the future, maybe get a uh, materials uh, recycling facility here in the city. So that, that's definitely on our radar, but that program wasn't large enough to to apply for those types of funds. It was a $4 million maximum ask. So that was the most we could do with that program, but it, it is on our radar as trying to get, you know, expand recycling services. Including maybe tire recycling into plain materials. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, we've certainly heard a lot about uh, getting tire shredder into the city, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, the next few slides, 16, 17, 18, and 19, are uh, grants that partners have uh, applied for and are waiting to hear funding on. Um, some highlights here, the, the one on the bottom of this first page, uh, you already just heard about from Entergy New Orleans, their application to the GRIP program. Uh, DOTD has been uh, very aggressive in pursuing uh, funding proposals for rail projects, uh, particularly for the Baton Rouge to New Orleans line. Uh, there's three of those listed here, uh, collectively uh, asking for around $90 million in support of that. Uh, the biggest item there being the Bonacary Rail Bridge. Uh, that needs to be replaced, um, so they're seeking funding for that. Um, on the, the next page, um, the uh, we, we've partnered with IMT, which is the Institute for Market Transformation on a uh, project to the Resilient and Efficient Code Implementation Program that would be uh, focused around building codes. Um, you want to say anything on that one? Sorry. Uh, 
No, that that's also part of the new uh, building performance standards coalition that the city just joined and that we updated this council on the last sustainability committee. Uh, so there's a few things moving on that piece and there's another uh, bucket of funding coming out through IRA that we're also looking to uh, apply for some funds for this effort for. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I think the, the one to highlight here, uh, well, first, one of the other awards that uh, we just heard about uh, yesterday after we had already uh, sent these slides over to y'all is the second one here from NOLA Public Schools for the Carver High School Solar Pilot. Um, this is a, a modest initial award as part of this program of which there will be future phases, but the school board received $50,000 um, around a project that would uh, is looking to install um, a solar farm at the Carver campus uh, in the Desire area. Uh, and the other one on this slide I want to highlight is with RTA. They just submitted this uh, last week to the low and no emission uh, vehicle program. Uh, it is a um, $71.4 million ask from the federal government to support RTA's efforts uh, to transition their fleet towards uh, more sustainable electric vehicles. This would include the purchase of uh, buses themselves, uh, the infrastructure to charge them at their uh, hubs, as well as some in-route charging equipment, and then um, a uh, solar uh, capacity for some resilience to the system so that if there are power failures, the, the bus system is not completely unable to charge and, be, and uh, provide service. Uh, on the final slide of outstanding grants, the one I want to highlight here is another transit related one. This is a joint application between the city, or uh, led by RTA, of which the city is a partner, to the RAISE program, uh, just shy of a $25 million ask to construct the Downtown Transit Center, uh, which would be located uh, on the Basin Street neutral ground at Canal Street. Uh, and this is building off of the, the planning efforts that RTA had done in recent years that identified that location as uh, the optimal place to, to construct facilities uh, to ensure that RTA transit users um, have a, a better, more comfortable and safer place to be waiting for buses, transferring between bus lines. Uh, and this would support the changes that were made last year to the, the network through the new links redesign. And then finally, to, to conclude with a, a, just the last few projects, these are um, some items that are currently in development uh, for upcoming deadlines. Um, one I want to highlight, uh, this is uh, just released about a week and a half ago, the um, Urban and Community Forestry. This is a program that came out of IRA, uh, the Inf Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we've been working very closely with Parks and Parkways and, and a variety of community um, organizations to develop a plan uh, to reinvest in our uh, urban tree canopy. Uh, there's another application coming up from DOTD, again, around Baton Rouge Rail Service, Passenger Rail Service. Um, that's actually being submitted today uh, for the deadline. Um, and we're hoping to continue our, our uh, so far, good track record with the NOAA and uh, National Wildlife and Fish Found National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grants uh, and working with CPRA, the Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority, on a new proposal for um, some Irish Bayou shoreline protection. Um, so with that, i um, happy to discuss any of these in further detail or answer any other questions that any of you have. Well, first, thank you for your work and, and really appreciate the, the very thorough uh, presentation that, that you had. Any questions from the dais? Seeing no questions. We're good. No, just commendations oh. for submitting all these applications, <laughs> you know, and keeping us up to date with it. So um, I'm very interested, obviously, in the Baton Rouge to New Orleans transportation um, route, you know, selfishly because it's the committee that I had, but it's so important to the airport and a other, couple of other things. So I hope we get that and let us know as a council what we have to do to help. That's all. The lobbying and the like, such an important right. project, you know. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your work. We'll keep you informed as as developments co keep coming on that one. The, right. the state's been very aggressive about pursuing funds for for that project in particular. Yeah, and I understand that the Bonnie uh, Carey Spillway is a pretty good possibility or a decent possibility, more than fifty percent, and that's great. You know, yeah, it, it's the single biggest piece of infrastructure improvement that that needs to be made along that corridor to uh, 
really make passenger rail viable right now. The existing structure has a 10 mile an hour speed limit, which is, you know, fine for, for freight rail, but you know, you don't want to be a passenger on the train that's crawling across that bridge. Uh, and, and for reference, um, the bridge in question here is, is the one that's parallel to airline highway. Um, the one that you can see parallel to I-10 uh, was just rebuilt. That is a different rail line. That That's the one that uh, currently provides Amtrak service uh, from New Orleans to the city of Chicago. Right. Uh, so the proposal from DOTD would be a similar thing, rebuilding you know the, the decades old timber bridge as a modern uh, new concrete bridge. Right. Let's make that happen. Thanks for your application and work. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank next, you, council members. Thank you. Next up uh, is the Committee for a Better New Orleans. That was our final presentation for real. <laughs> you can fill that out. Feel free to ignore it as well. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Nelly. Still? Yes. yes, still morning. Good morning, Sage. If you all could introduce yourselves and begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, folks. This is uh, my name is Nellie Katzen. I'm the executive director of the Committee for a Better New Orleans. I'm joined here by our program partner, Sage Michael, who I know a lot of y'all know with Healthy Golf. Sage Michael, uh, lifelong resident and community advocate. Great to see y'all again. Morning. We're really excited to share an update with you all this morning um, on our Building Our Future campaign. Just for the audience at home and those folks who may not be familiar with our work, Committee for a Better New Orleans is a nonprofit civic engagement organization. We are working to build healthy soil for New Orleans grassroots through connecting people to each other, to decision makers, um, and to the knowledge, network, and skills that they need to make change in their neighborhoods. Our Building Our Future campaign um, for a refresher has three major components. We're working to educate stakeholders inside and outside, but especially outside City Hall, gathering priorities from residents and strengthening proposals for New Orleans IJA applications. We've got major advancements on all three fronts and excited to share with you. Under educating stakeholders, we've been maintaining a website and compendium of resources um, for the community to understand what's going on with AISHA, both what the policy is, how it's structured, and what pro projects are in progress within uh, the city and city agencies. Um, we have a webinar series we're doing right now um, with about 100 registrants on each different area of infrastructure, energy, streets, etc. We've been giving presentations at community meetings and doing outreach and education, both inside and outside City Hall. Last month, we worked with the Office of Human Rights and Equity and hosted a training on Justice 40 for about 80 city employees, most of whom hadn't really learned about the framework before. This is just a screenshot from our website, cbno.org slash IIJA. Again, it explains the policy and has a tracker of city applications, as well as city plans that mention infrastructure or equity um, that folks might be interested in learning more about. There's also a great search tool on this website to help entities, uh, community organizations, neighborhood groups, um, and non-city agencies to find and apply for um, grant programs for which they're eligible. It's just a little bit more about our Eyes on Infrastructure series. We're talking all things climate, infrastructure, and how to bring solutions to your neighborhood. We have two more sessions left on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 7. All sessions are recorded, and they're on our website at cbno.org. We're also working to gather priorities with residents and community organizations. Um, this was something we said we would gather a thousand stories. And so far we've gathered over 600 and that's thanks to a partnership that we've made with um, Healthy Golf, IC Change uh, and various community organizations. This was something that was already in progress 
and we were able to jump on and add value. This is one such story. I won't read it all out loud for you, but for the folks at home, they can read it as a follow-up about a former gem of a community neighborhood in the Florida neighborhood. I know Council Member Green is very familiar with this project um, and what residents would like to see happen with it. When we came to you initially, we lacked the sophisticated data software to be able to turn resident stories into usable data. So we're really especially grateful for our partnership with Healthy Golf and IC Change, um, which has allowed us to really turn those resident stories into data. I brought along our partner, Sage Michael, to talk more about exactly what we're doing through our, our collaborative process. Yeah, thank you, Nelly, for, um, for leading us in the discussion. And so, um... The essence of my community organizing is putting people first. Um, with Healthy Golf, I serve as a New Orleans climate justice organizer. I'm a resident of New Orleans East and lifelong resident. As you see on this right here, you see our community partners, Sankofa, a community voice. It's all about putting community organizations first and building them up with supporting partners. You also see IC Change, uh, UNO, and of course, Committed for Better New Orleans and Healthy Golf. Now you can work the slide, it's right, fine. Yeah, thank you for that. And so we're taking it beyond just meeting. We're not meeting just to meet with these community organizations, community partners. First of all, these are hired experts. As we pay experts in other fields, we pay community as experts themselves. We make sure that these leaders are, are, are a resource. We have events like coffee shop events. And then we meet in these community organizations within their own meetings and we support them in being leaders of their own community. We make sure we have like pep walks where we go in the community, walk around the community, making sure we gather them and we meet back at their community centers and their stormwater center in their parks and we gather to build and, com and commute with them. This is resident driven data. The residents in the community we came across, they're aware of the community checkbox in these applications and, and so forth. They're aware of being uh, data extraction. And so this pro project right here allows us to educate them give them the ability and agency, and we are anchored in community. Healthy Golf is anchored in community, this data stays home and local. So as of June 2022, we collected over 604 posts. You'll see that majority of these posts on this chart, the big pie is storms and flooding. We suffer from that a lot. You'll see water and sewage, and you see streets and potholes and coasts. We love in the spring, but get ready for the heat. And that happens a lot of health effects. So we have certain posts. This post right here is off of Haynes and Vincent, one of my favorite places. Originally, when New Orleans East was built, it was built without sidewalks. There's a need for sidewalk. There's people throwing trash out their windows, so there's a need for education. There's no trash bins or recycle bins in this area. So this person right here said, I see the issue, but here's a solution. I saw Donnell and Reginald out there doing what they do. Let their light shine. Yes, yes, yes. And so with these posts, you have the, the, the data and the conversation that people love. Right here, we have the, we talked about microgrids earlier. You have microgrids that go small as a box, as big as the churches, as big as, you know, solar farms we're talking about adding on to our community. These are solutions we're coming with. And as we talk about other things, and one of our topics we talk about a lot, I don't know if this looks like my street or anything like that, but we may see it as a lot in our community. And, and that's a, that's a lot of issues right there in one picture. Uh, first of all, it's a lot of trauma in that picture, uh, which we don't face and we don't recognize. So we come with this. I myself, I have a kayak in my backyard and a bicycle as a need because we see that we got to become clearer with the solutions. And if it don't take us being thinking about differently, how we live, we, how we live with water, how we treat water as a resource and not a waste, how we hide it, how we pollute it, and then we throw it out. How are we going to enjoy our crawfish, our oysters, if we don't care for it and make it livable in New Orleans? So that being said, the most impacted people must be heard and must be the most invested. Thanks so much, Sage. It's been really fantastic working with this team and employing about 22 community engagement leads, especially from most left out communities. We've included a few screenshots of um, kind of the bulk, where the bulk of our posts are compared to the EPA's EJ screening tool for a number of different Justice 40 factors um, that we know that communities are looking for. We've really emphasized the communities who are most left out um, and are hosting walks in six, 
more. Yeah, we have about six walks coming up. We got music and fun and games and everything. Yeah. So you can see the bulk of our posts really align with where you see the darkest red, yellow, and orange areas in each of these maps for low life expectancy, for traffic proximity, and for overall disadvantage. The last thing that we're doing as part of this project is we're helping to strengthen proposals, not only by providing the data that we collect out to the community as well as to the city. We meet every month with Zach and Dan, um, but we've also been working with them on a bigger project towards building equity into each phase of the infrastructure pipeline in conversations with city of um, employees. I've heard a lot of barriers to building equity, and they're really basic a lot of the time. It's not that we don't have the know-how or the desire, but we have structural barriers that are getting in the way. Um, so we've convened a group of many stakeholders uh, to develop a collaborative set of recommendations for city entities throughout the infrastructure pipeline. We're in the phase right now of research, and by the end of the spring, we'll work into drafting re recommendations. The exciting thing about this is we're working directly with city departments um, to make sure that we are not missing anything that um, that could be a barrier that keeps these things from being successful. For research, we're delighted to have brought on our partners at the Southern Economic Advancement Project. They've been developing an, a massive amount of research um, for us that they'll also be able to bring to other cities across the South. We're especially excited to work with them because a lot of the models from elsewhere are just not applicable here. Um, we've had a really wonderful meeting with some folks in California who have much more progressive workforce policies than we have in New Orleans. So um, we're, we're facing a distinctly Southern reality. And so having these researchers and policy experts specifically focused on the South has been a real asset to our organization. They're bringing us national models and promising practices. And we've been convening a group alongside the Workplace Justice Project and a, over a dozen other partners. It's open to anyone. And I have our details on our next meeting here. But we're working with groups locally to apply to research local models and local practices and apply those national best practices to our local context. We know that off the shelf solutions don't often work in New Orleans, but New Orleanians know what does. I mentioned at each phase of the infrastructure project pipeline, and this is just how we define that. From when a project is first conceived as maybe we should apply for funding for this. Of course, you all know there's a lot of steps that go into project planning before planning begins. Um, we're calling that prioritizing. Um, through prioritizing, planning and design, and the actual workforce and work site practices as we're building out these things, we can advance equity and our recommendations will be specific and actionable recommendations for each of these pipeline steps. We have a bunch of events going on this spring. These are our next three. Um, we have our next equity framework steering meeting. That's about the topic I've just discussed coming on Monday from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, that'll be a great reintroduction meeting. So if there are folks who are listening at home um, or in y'all's offices um, that would like to participate, we'd love to have your participation at this or any future meeting we meet monthly. We're having a walk in Holly Grove and a garden party on Friday, April 28th from four to seven to observe the infrastructure in the neighborhood uh, and, is, and also educate folks who come out uh, to join us for free food and music. And finally, we are concluding our Eyes on Infrastructure webinar series on May 3rd. We have two more sessions left. They're Wednesdays from six to seven and they're all up on our website, which is listed here on the screen. Folks who are watching from home or interested in more information can reach out to us directly. They can find our website on the screen here, cbno.org, or our phone number is also there. Call or text us, 504-356-3156. Thanks for the opportunity to share. We'll take any questions. Thank you, um, Sage and Nellie, for your presentation. Appreciate that. And I, I appreciate you working directly with city departments and including them and in, in your work and, and also in, in your events. Um, what about also working to include um, RTA, uh, Entergy, Sewage and Water Board in these events? Because from the presentations today, they're applying for tens of millions of dollars worth of IJA dollars. And I do think it's really important that the community hears directly from them. 
Absolutely. Instead of us trying to relay what they're trying to do, they need to explain it to the community themselves. We're seeking every opportunity we can to invite those folks. I actually ran up to the Entergy presenter I saw you. right you after. Gave me that idea. Yeah. <laughs> because um, one of our workforce, one of our groups is looking specifically at workforce and community benefits. Mm -hmm. And so where we can, we want to align that, give them the opportunity to present to the community partners we're convening and give us the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, there are so we are conveners and connectors here right. at CBNO, and there are so many dots to connect. Um, we were able to work with uh, Ride New Orleans and RTA on their strategic mobility plan, which is right now under revision. We had a community meeting for that just last week. So we are finding opportunities to work with these agencies and we'll continue to build them into our plan. Awesome. Any way that we can help in that, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Harris. Yeah, no, Sage, always great to see you. Thanks. Nelly, always great to see you as well. Um, I just, you know, I just went online to make sure that everybody knows your social media handles, how they can get in touch with you. This this work is so important. And I know we rely so much on social media to get the word out. Um, but I also like to know about outreach to folks who might not have technology or access and how you guys are really doing outreach to make sure that they're involved in these discussions. That's really the value of the community engagement leads that we've uh, brought onto the team. These are folks who are out in the neighborhood every day, all day, um, and they are getting a stipend in order to engage those folks who are not connecting with us online. Um, Sage, do you want to share anything more about that? Yeah, um, so we we know that a lot of these people who face these issues are a lot of elderly people, non-traditional people. So partner with, I'm so happy to say, like people like Ms. Raleen with Sankofa, um, and, and, and to see that light bulb click on when we educate her just a little bit, it's like, wow, I have it. And she builds those community leads and Sankofa supports her by having an intern to come support her and do her work. And so we, we, we go meet at their community events already. We have uh, community coffee shops. We're going to have that we call pep walk, people empowering people walk. But well, we just walk the neighborhood and identify these issues, meet back at their community park and have this gathering. And we have we believe in culture and music. So have music and fun along the way. So we're gonna have people outreach to those community members to say, hey, what are you doing? Meet us back at the park. We have more engagement opportunity. And so yes, there are non-traditional ways and we are very supportive, but we want these community partners to be empowered after this pro project is over with. It's not a like one off or we come daddy track. We are building relationships on and on and we're here to stay. So it's important. I had to laugh because I was at a community meeting um, at a church and somebody handed out QR codes and it's, you know, you have a, a lot of folks who are seniors who are like, what, what do I do with this? I don't even know what to do, right? I was like, I don't even know what to do with a QR code half the time. Um, so just, I think those, those traditional means of outreach and community engagement so important and i see that you guys are really taking the lead on that and i really commend you for that because it takes so much just to make sure that everybody has a, a voice um in this process and i really am grateful for you both thank you council member green a simple question for the public could you confirm where the meetings are the eye on infrastructure meetings they are online and okay. folks can register on our website cbno.org slash events slash eyes on all right. Um, if anybody has issues registering, they can call or text me and I can help them out. Okay. And my number's right there on the screen. So they can register right through the, I yep. just want the public to know. Thank I'm you. especially, I'm going to attend on Wednesday because I'm a board member of Seoul and um, the green infrastructure is our, our thing. So I also want to report that the Odile Davis playground looks a lot different now because of work that Jordan and others have done, including the, um, Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Engagement. We had a big event that was attended by over 100 people, and um, they did a really good job in that area and at the park. So our goal is to have those programs in place that attract people to that park and to keep it up. So I um, appreciate the work. It's so exciting and really a testament to the, co the collaboration that's possible through this work, right? Our first pep walk that we're doing tons of now um, was a week before that Neighborhood Cares event in order to help prep the city for the projects that they could tackle on that day. Right. And so through working together, through gathering residents to really experience and share their experience, um, we're able to make progress. And thank you right. so much for your leadership there. Councilman Green, I just put a record, I'll say that 
we we I met Jordan some while ago. He wasn't sitting on that side of the rostrum in the past, but through um, working with community leaders in that, and he built relationships up in Odell Davis Park. It wasn't just like he jumped in. They knew him. We ran across everyone when we did a pep walk in the neighborhood. He, he helped work with committed for better New Orleans to support it. And now you are giving my opportunity to move further. This was going to take to make New Orleans move further and further faster. Having people com- connect with the community, non-traditional people that come in and you are empowering them to become representatives for the city of New Orleans. Thank you for that. Okay, I appreciate that means you a lot. that. And for members of the council, do you, do you know Jordan Michael? He's joining my staff as the community. And he also works part-time as a project yeah. coordinator for CBN. Okay, well, good. I didn't even know he was here, so he can speak for himself. But yeah, and, and anyone, is very motivated. He's anyone really who was in the past council definitely knows yeah. every oh, single one of the budget hearings. Yeah, Makes a difference. Sure does. Welcome, Jordan. I didn't know you were here. Good to see you. He's going to be a great asset to the community that he works in. You know? That's right. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no more questions, that uh, concludes our meeting. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. You have a comment card, Ms. Kim? Come on up, Ms. Kim. I just want to go on the record to say that the reason why I'm here today is because I tried to watch this meeting online and it was not available during that during the um during the actual end time yeah. process. So I'm walking in here not knowing jack about what happened today. And this is when I walk in enough time to come up here to this microphone and say that I did not have access. But I'm going to tell you this, that I'm going to go back and review this meeting because, you you know, the public can't give commentary online anymore to these meetings. So this is what we have right here. And I have to go through all of that to park out front of here. You understand what I'm saying? That kind of stuff. And yeah, I'm upset that I have to come down here for what my tax dollars have already paid for me to have access to. I don't like that. Basic and simple things. And if you can't basically and simply operate from there, how can the community, you are our only line to the community, you are our only line to having a voice. So what you do is just so critical to me in the work that I do. I, I need you to be able to do that. And even if people are not sitting in here, people are watching and seeing which my hope is all in you guys, man. If you guys can't do it, then which what chance do I stand of being able to do it? And the millions of dollars that I saw that were going to be discussed in this meeting, our community needs to know about it because it needs to trickle down to us. And we need to be able to have access and not just be spending those dollars on paying salaries. You understand what I'm saying? We actually need to get some movement and absolutely have community involvement because if we don't, then I'm going to have to come down here. And I don't want to have to do that, and I know y'all don't want me to have to do that. Y'all don't want me to do that because y'all don't make it easy for me to park. But I swear to God, as sure as I'm standing here today, I will be sending you my parking bills if I have to come down here for another meeting that's not broadcasted live. I'm going to charge you guys for that. Ms. Kim, first, thank you. Um, I hear you. And thank you for letting us know that there was a there was an issue with today's uh, broadcast. So I appreciate you letting us know so that we can work hard to correct that. Uh, number two, um, we still, uh, because of, you know, issues with transportation, all those different things, we're still going to allow for online comments. So I just wanted to let you know that that's still going to be available. No, I want it in, in real time. Oh, in real time. Got in it. Real Got time. It. Got it. Not Got an it. aftermath. Got no, it. Uh-uh, that won't do because you mean, have to you mean, yeah, I got, I got you. I got you. Have that. Okay. And, uh, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing with Garden Plaza. Mm. And I see you and those meetings are critical to have those online. So because of what happened today, I'm gonna have to be here in person to see that Gordon Plaza meeting this afternoon. And it is important. And we watching you, we see you. Okay, thank you. Thank Thank you, Ms. Kim. If I I may also, um, ma'am, we'd love to connect as well. Uh, My organization works to help connect people to exactly these sorts of conversations, especially when they're not able to come down and pay for the parking and et cetera. We're doing a ton of community events. I'll give you my card when we come out here or we'll exchange numbers. I would love to connect with you and okay. kind of see how we can bring this info to your community where you are. Absolutely, because I know him too. Yeah. <laughs> Good guy to know. Yeah. We've got you. 
All right, guys, thank you. Thank you for your um, presentation. Motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Oh, seconded yeah, by Council well. Member Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we're adjourned. Thank you all. Let me go. My parking just expired. <laughs>